All right, so in the previous video, we went through this substitution reaction where we started with 2-chlorobutane and we end up with 2-butanol. Um, and we said that it had a, very, a number of very interesting features. First of all, it went with inversion. So it started with one enantiomer and it went to another. And secondly, it was first order in both nucleophile and substrate. So both in 2-chlorobutane and hydroxide ion. It was first order in them both. So second order, order overall. And lastly, it was fastest for, these types of reactions are fastest for methyl and then primary, then secondary, then tertiary being the slowest type of reaction. And the question was, how do we explain all of these results? How do we come up with a mechanism that helps us understand how this reaction actually happens? So that's what this video is about. So I've redrawn uh, the reaction we just talked about in a slightly neater form and just summarize the key points. It's second orbit order overall. It goes with inversion and methyl is faster than primary, secondary, and much, much faster than tertiary. And we're gonna see this is called this is gonna be a mechanism called the SN2 mechanism. So let's draw out the proposed mechanism that helps to explain all of these different factors. And the proposed mechanism for this, we're gonna say is called proposed mechanism is called the backside attack. The backside attack. This explains everything to do with this substitution reaction. So what we're gonna do is redraw this 2-chlorobutane in a slightly different way. CH3, the H goes here, and we will draw our ethyl group pointing up. Here's our chloride ion, a chloride, not an ion yet, just a chloride group. And here's our hydroxide and minus charge. And there's, um, so what happens in this reaction, and the best proposal we have to explain all these different features, is a lone pair from our hydroxide ion comes in and attacks this carbon from the backside. Backside meaning 180 degrees from the carbon chlorine bond. And why does it attack there? Well, as it turns out, there's actually an empty orbital present in that position. And this is called the, this is a, sometimes called a sigma, sigma star orbital or, or antibonding orbital. And it's an empty orbital. It is the uh, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Um, and you, of course, when you're gonna form a bond, you're gonna take your pair of electrons. You have to put them where there aren't any electrons there previously. You have to put it into an empty orbital. And this is, this is an empty orbital present, which is, you almost kind of think of it like an eject button for this carbon chlorine bond. And we're gonna donate a pair of electrons from the oxygen into this antibonding orbital. And at the same time, we are going to break the carbon chlorine bond. And that is going to uh, go through a transition state, which is, looks a lot like this. So we're gonna actually have a partial bond between the oxygen and the carbon. And the CH3, instead of being a wedge and tetrahedral, the carbon the central carbon is more uh, trigonal bipyramidal. This is the what we call this. It's five a five coordinate carbon, and it's really only stable and present for an instant. This is this is what we mean by a transition state. Something that's not very long lived. It it has a very short lifetime, and each of the chloride and the hydroxide ion have partial negative charges in this, this carbon actually is a partial positive charge. So what happens is when our hydroxide ion attacks the antibonding orbital here, we're gonna to start to form an oxygen carbon bond. And this oxygen carbon bond is gonna to start to form and at the same time, we're gonna to start to weaken our carbon chlorine bond. And as this occurs, the, like I said, the geometry of the central carbon goes from tetrahedral. So this CH3 starts swinging towards the chloride a little bit. So does the H until everything is sort of flat. These three uh, groups here actually form a slight bit of a plane. 
And from here, the reaction progresses through the, the remainder of the reaction. The hydroxide ion forms a full bond with the carbon instead of just being a partial, partial bond. And the CH3 goes from being sort of at about 8 o'clock, if you think of it like that, to more like 4 o'clock here. And the hydroxide and the hydrogen is there. Our chloride ion ends up here. Cl minus. Okay, so this is the proposed mechanism for this substitution reaction. So why does it help to explain all of these three things which I mentioned earlier? Well, first of all, we mentioned the reaction is second order overall. So it depends on both the concentration of hydroxide ion and our substrate. And this mechanism helps to explain that because we only have one reaction or one step occurring in this reaction. It happens all at once. So as we're forming carbon oxygen, we're breaking carbon chlorine. And that depends, that's going to, the rate of this reaction is going to depend on the concentration of both hydroxide ion and our 2 chloro butane in this case, which is we call our substrate or electrophile. Okay. And the inversion as well. So remember, we started off with one enantiomer. This is actually the uh, S enantiomer, and we're going to the R. And this is also the S, and we're inverting this, and it's going to the R. So this backside attack helps to explain the inversion because as, as it does the backside attack, and it sort of flips open like an umbrella in the wind, uh, and it eventually sort of flips over to the other side. So here we've got our OH on the left-hand side, and our, like I said, everything on this side has flipped, flipped over. So this is an inversion. Actually, maybe I should draw this H instead of pointing straight out like that. Maybe draw it a little bit further back. That's a little bit more correct. Okay, good. So that actually helps to show why this reaction goes through inversion. Now, finally, why does it matter if we have a methyl group or a prime? Why would it be faster for methyl versus primary, secondary, or, or tertiary? Well, so our, our backside attack is occurring uh, against this tiny little antibonding orbital, the sigma star orbital. And in order for this reaction to occur, the, the OH has to find its way into being able to donate this pair of electrons to this antibonding orbital. So let's just think of the two extreme cases for the moment. Imagine that instead of having uh, H's here, we had some very bulky groups, and I haven't drawn them all out, but imagine we had CH3s. Now, I've just drawn it as CH3, but remember that each CH3 is actually like a little tripod of hydrogens and carbons. And it, not only that, because we have free rotation around the carbon, carbon bond, this sweeps out kind of a cone of space. And so this ends up actually making it very, very difficult for the hydroxide ion to find this antibinding orbital because in every approach or almost every single approach that the hydroxide ion will attempt to get to this antibinding orbital, it's going to bump into one of these very bulky methyl groups. And this group as well would have hydrogens and the carbon that would be also rotating. So it's very, very, very difficult for the nucleophile to reach, which is why this reaction would be very slow for tertiary. Now, instead of having three methyl groups, instead, if we had just, in the simplest case, three hydrogens. So these hydrogens don't have any additional bonds um, that take up any space. Uh, they, they simply exist as, as just individual atoms. So this, in this case, the hydroxide ion has a very easy time of, of reaching this antibonding orbital because there's no potential for steric, what we call steric hindrance. Steric hindrance is what we were showing in the previous example with tert butyl, um, where this, the, it's, the approach from the nucleophile to the antibonding orbital is hindered sterically by the, the large steric bulk of the, the groups present. So here, there's no steric hindrance, so this reaction is very fast. So this mechanism of uh, the backside attack helps to explain also the fact that methyl is going to be faster than primary, which is faster than secondary. And for, for our purposes, tertiary 
uh, SN2 reactions are, are very, very seldom observed to occur. So the, the re so this reaction in total is called the SN2 mechanism, or the mechanism of the reaction is called the SN2, and it stands for substitution, and it is, it is a substitution reaction, and the N stands for nucleophilic, and the two is for bimolecular. So that's second order, order overall is what we refer to as bimolecular. So in subsequent videos, we'll go into some of the consequences of this mechanism uh, in how to be able to tell uh, based on what type of substrate you have, what type of nucleophile you have, how to predict uh, whether or not a given reaction will proceed through this SN2 mechanism.